pictures on the monitor. These are basically the three types of files so that I use when I'm working on a portrait. And I, I try to get them as nice a photo as I can so that I can zoom in without it pixelating. You can see that the, pic, the color picture is very prominent. It's very easy to be distracted by the color. And it's, it's much more difficult, at least for me, to gauge the values when I'm looking at a color picture. So that's another reason that I felt like this is a really good study for all of us because we're moving again, we're moving the color out of the way, and we're just looking at value. Now your charcoal, trying to develop your charcoal values is just practice because you're going to cover over those. It's practice, it's familiarizing yourself with where all the values are. The more you do that, the more it's, it's instinctive as you're painting. So <clears throat> what I thought I would do real quick is just show you, we're gonna only use these two colors. I'm using the cheap brand of Georgian Raw Umber. Uh, all I'm gonna do is mix several values between the white and the Raw Umber. A lot of people struggle with the mixing process because uh, especially in the beginning, you don't realize how much paint it takes to color. I always start with white and just add a speck, and it's a little different to paint up or, uh, to mix up right. There is an artist, David, uh, John David Kassan, who has an upright palette. I don't know if y'all have seen that on Facebook, but it stands upright just like this, <coughs> and he mixes this way. And I guess it's good as long as you don't have any real, real runny paint. And just slowly, slowly wipe off. If you need to, I've got extra telephone books down there as you're mixing. You just pull the palette knife through your uh, telephone book and just make yourself a range of browns from darkest all the way to white. You notice when you're mixing, I see a lot of people struggle with a palette knife, and I'm, I struggled with it for so long. It just felt so awkward in my hands. And I would watch Shirley mix, and she would. it just seemed so easy for her. Uh, I'm keeping all the color on the back side of the palette knife. When you get it around here, then you're trying to get it off, and it's just real awkward. So I'm um, trying to keep it all on the back side. It's so nice to be able to scoop it and keep it in a nice pile. I did suggest that you use um, so, uh, an absorbent palette if you have something, a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper. I want this paint on this first layer to be fairly stiff if possible. Um, and that is so that it's on this slick board so that it's not slipping, sliding around. You want it to be um, stiff like, almost like toothpaste and not real buttery and creamy. Permalba is very creamy and buttery. So Permalba would not be a good white to use. If, you, if that's all you have, you're welcome to borrow some of mine or you can put, go ahead and set it out early and let it absorb some of the oil out. Anyway, these are my, some brand new rosemary ivory brushes. I, I've used these several times, but I really like them. They are a bristle type brush, a synthetic bristle. So the hairs, um, not being natural, they don't swell. They're, they're nice and stiff for the first layer of oil painting. Now eventually we're going to go to some softer sable-like brushes when we start glazing. So I'm going to primarily, today, I'm going to start out using the picture with poster edges on it, the filter, because it's broken the values down into uh, darkest dark, medium dark, medium light, and very light, and highlight. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six values with that poster uh, filter. I'm going to break it down for you if you have trouble seeing where the one value stops and another begins. And I'm going to put them in choppy like this, mosaically. That's my word I use all the time, but it's the only way I can think to make you stop and see all the different values. If you look at this sometimes, you almost read, that, especially through here, all the same. So we want to be able to put these in, and that's the beauty of oil paint. We can put all these in real choppy mosaically today. We can take, before the day's over, we can take a brush and really soften them together. A soft little makeup mop brush or a mongoose, if you have the long mongooses, those would work perfect. I always have an eye on the clock when I'm painting somewhat. I hate that. I, like to, I would like to just have a day where I totally didn't have to watch the clock. 
but I do watch the clock to see how much time I have because I don't want to start putting my darks in and have little splotches of dark everywhere and not be able to get all that area blended. So I'll probably start, I'll probably start right here with her today and just start laying in some of these darks. I always keep a paper towel in my hand as I paint so that I can wipe the brush and stay out of the mineral spirits. If I get in the mineral spirits early on, and it's a good idea to keep your cover on your mineral spirits. Oh, so you won't be tempted. <laughs> no, well, also because of the fumes. Because oh. although it's odorless mineral spirits, it's still putting out vapors in the air that aren't healthy for us. So it's a good idea to keep it closed. And that will help you stay out of it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the darkest dark that I see on Sydney. And... Um, just start painting it in. And I'm painting kind of sideways here so you guys can see. So my strokes will be a little um, choppy. But that's okay, because I really just want to cover it. Can everybody see? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, even, I'm going to go down here a little bit because I've got some darks. That's my habit, is to work around the canvas with while I have that color on my... But of course, am I going to get to this today? I probably am, because after y'all... After I get done with everything today, probably 10 o'clock tonight, I'll come back and totally cover this so that I have the whole thing covered tonight. I like the um, uh, sense of urgency that you have sometimes with that because it makes me paint. It gives me a reason to get in here and do it instead of all the excuses that I can come up with. Um, and I know you do it too. <laughs> it's easy to say, well, I gotta cook supper, or I gotta go do this and that. And you know, sometimes you do, but sometimes you can just say, well, you know, what? I've got to do this because if I don't, it's gonna dry. So your got tos can can flip around sometimes if you want them to, or if you make them. Uh, I've moved to the next value, um, and I'm just gonna start laying it in. This is actually kind of fun because it's like working a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and you can just put little pieces in. I'm being a little bit painterly. Short strokes. I've heard uh, instructors say, don't make any stroke longer than your brush. Bristles. Your brush bristles. bristles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, not the whole brush, no. Because that slows you down and it makes you really look at what you're doing instead of making big, huge, just like with drawing, we make big, bold statements. So I'm just kind of moving slowly from dark to, hey, Right, come on in here, gal. Um, dark to medium, just moving my way across the canvas. And I'm it because we're using raw umber and white, we don't really have to worry about making mud. Sydney, sorry, but you are going to have like a little mud face here in a minute. <laughs> um, even though we're not making mud, the browns are going to look a little bit dirty as we're working on it. And I'm just um, you know, I'm kind of judging that maybe a little bit too dark, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust these values. I just want to get kind of close as I'm working. And you see how fast this goes? Pretty fast. You find pretty quickly that you get almost the same range here before you know it. You're painting everything all in the same value. So sometimes what I do is I'll jump on over here and get this really <coughs> bright. But see, it's kind of hard to judge that now because it's the same color as the, <coughs> almost the same color as the background. So I can come back in here and get this middle piece in. And it doesn't even matter if they touch. It's sort of just like a little rainbow. It doesn't even matter if they touch. They can go almost next to each other. They don't have to totally touch. Up here. Man, this is fun. I'll get to do it in a minute. And it's going on really nice and smooth with this masonite. There's no ridges like you have in, in your canvas. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty fun. Normally I would probably be doing this, but actually being over to the side is good because I'm, the planes of her face are this way, this way, this way. You could go down this way. If, if you can think about if this were a head of clay modeling around the head, and that helps build form on the face just by itself. Gotta remember what color I have when I'm a little darker there. <clears throat> so 
So that's got that range. Let me go ahead and get her lip covered. And the, the top lip always casts a shadow. Um, the bottom lip, unless the light's coming from underneath, which is that haunted house light that's not very flattering. And it's darker. I'm always comparing values. So see, I just made that wrong judgment there. That's too light. Her lip is about the same value as this beside it. So all I have to do is go over here and get a little bit darker. It's almost going to disappear in there. It's a little bit lighter as it comes around here. So I can put a little bit of pure white in there. A little bit of pure white there on the tip of her chin. Since I've got that on my brush, I can come up here, put a little bit of that really light up the plane of the nose, bridge of the nose. So that's got a little, a pretty good little ridge. Let me go ahead and get the side of her nose too. And then I'm gonna get a soft mongoose brush and I'm gonna start the process of just softening this together a little bit so you can kind of see how to do that. So you only got about five options here instead of two million when you're mixing color. <laughs> Not two million really, but you've only really got about five options of which one do I pick. So it really narrows the feel down. My hand is hard like this. I'm used to bracing my arm on something when I paint, or I, I use my pinky uh, sometimes to brace me. <coughs> the darkest note on the side of her nose is right here. There's a little shadow color right there. I also see a dark note here. It's not quite that dark. <laughs> I've got two mongoose brushes. Also, if you have a small, uh, small sable brush, if you're working on a small painting like this, you're going to want to use something kind of small. But a really soft brush that's not going to mash into this paint, but that's just going to feather over the top. I'm going to keep a clean paper towel in my hand so that I can wipe this gently. And then I'm just going to start, probably start with my light, one or the other, light or dark. And I'm just going to start softening it together. And you've got, I've got enough paint on there to move it around. We do the same thing with pastel. Uh, when you lay pastel in, it, you just, you deposit the color on there and then you, we, I like to move it around with the, um, I don't know, I don't have enough up here, so let me just work down in here. I move it around with the pastel pencils. You gotta wipe quite a bit, otherwise you're just gonna drag all that dark color over into the light. It can, whatever way works, if it, got, if it works better to come up along the edge and pull up, that seems to be working good around the contours of this cheek. This, this first layer, it would be fabulous, excuse me, I'm showering. It would be fabulous if you could get this exactly right on this first go around. Chances are you won't. Yeah. No, okay. And that's okay, I don't. Usually I have to go back and tweak it, fix my drawing. Um, really, you've got to have a soft brush for this because if you, if you pull the bristle brush out to try to do this, um, this may work. You would pick up the, the paint. Mine, mine will just take the paint off. Something. It will lift it right off and you'll have big bristle marks in there. That works pretty good. The only problem with this big brush is you're going to end up with all one color because it's so big. You're going to end up getting rid of all your values. So if you have a small one, now the drier your paint at this point, this, this paint's pretty wet so it's moving around on me quite a bit. But it's, it's opaque. It's covering well. So see, you know, we're not fighting at all with the background. Um, <clears throat> this may be a little dark, but I can adjust all that later. So I'm just gonna, once I get it, start to get it bl blended, I can move it around like this a little bit more. If you should accidentally forget to wipe off and then you put the dark <laughs> shadow, I mean, can you wipe it off? Rather you can than wipe, you can totally wipe all this off like you did off. today, but you're gonna wipe your charcoal drawing off too. Mm -hmm. That's Unless you use a little fixative, and I do have some fixative if you're worried. If you've got a really detailed drawing and you're really worried about losing it, but you, you won't. See, I can take a little bit of pure white and 
come back in here on, with this mongoose brush because it's soft. It's not going to lift it off like the bristle brush will. So I can come back in like that. And then I can work on this thing and it'll stay wet probably until it'll be a little tacky in the morning. But these colors I've chosen specifically, raw umber dries almost overnight for the most part, and the titanium dries pretty quickly. So I know I have a window. I, when I'm doing this, I jump up the next morning and go flying in there, see if I can move it around a little bit or soften things. Because sometimes it just feels a little too wet and you can't really, I think if that was just a little bit tackier, I could, um, so it might be good if you did it in the morning and then in the afternoon you went back and checked it. Um, because we put the zinser on here, it's not as absorbent as another ground or surface would be that would suck all the oil out and make it dry faster. I do see this really strong line right there. So how would I handle that if I want to make it, it's strong here, it's, it's more of a, uh, a, a gray down. So I can come back in there with just some pure white with this mongoose brush and just gradually as much as you can as you move out you know you're going to have you're going to be more committed to the areas around it so kind of keep an eye on the clock um, if you if you have the afternoon free that you can come back to it it's going to be easier for you if it totally dries it's okay but at the end of your session today be sure you come around here and you soften out your edges anywhere that any so that when you paint next time, you don't have a ridge of paint there to paint back into. Uh, nobody ever shared that with me, and it was one of the most important part of oil painting to me, one of the most important things. Because then I have to get something and scrape it off, and it's just easier if you do this. If, if, if I would rather err on the side of this whole face being a blur today than to leave it with any sharp edges. Um, that would be much easier to go back and work into later. You can keep adjusting these values over and over and over. If you want to keep this layer fairly lean, like I said last time, not a lot of, don't use any medium, <clears throat> don't want to use a lot of uh, thick, thick paint. Darks generally go on very thin and transparent, very thin under here. So you don't want to keep painting on here and do 10 layers and then try to glaze over that. But you do, once this dries and we, we come back in here and start, uh, tweaking the values we're only going to we're going to be using a bristle type brush probably about that size to go in there and just feather put a little tiny bit of dry white on there and scumble it over so that it gradually lightens an area that's too dark you're not going to be totally wetting it back up again so you're just going to be using little pieces of paint on the corner to um, correct your value and you'll see it goes pretty easy. It just, you know, once this is dry, you can just barely lighten that just a little bit and feather it out. Also, I have the fixative, so if you want to spray, if you're worried about losing your drawing, we can take it, always take it outside, leave it for about five minutes because that spray is very toxic. It's very strong. Yeah. What, what does that do? It's fixative. So I don't really like to use it, but if I'm really, if I've worked really hard on the drawing and I'm really afraid of losing it, and the thing is, that fear thing of afraid you're going to lose it is what we're working against because you should be all, always able to redraw it, redraw it. And sometimes if something's really, really difficult, you want to put a little fixative on it. Just be very sparing with it because it's when you read the side of the can of fixative, it's loaded with all kinds of chemicals. You're putting that under your layer of, of oil paint. So people use it all the time, but I, I, I just try to not. If if possible. Also, I forgot to mention, if you struggle with knowing what value to use, I have a couple of these. If you don't have them, you can always, if you use this middle tone gray, you can gauge real easily what the value is. Is it the same? Is it much lighter? Can everybody kind of see that through here? So you can see how much darker that shawl is than the middle tone gray. You can also, this works the same way. You can use this to gauge, well, how dark does it need to be? So if you're struggling with what color it really is, and usually it's the middle values that we struggle with. We can see the darkest dark and the lightest light. So you're welcome to borrow these.